Good afternoon. Welcome to the talk entitled Building Your Sustainability Toolkit Using LCA to Inform Your Device Development, part of the Learning with Lunch series. My name is Alistair Willoughby and I head up the Mechanical Engineering Group at Team Consulting with a particular focus on sustainable engineering. Sustainable engineering and sustainable product development is a key topic of interest to many people, both at a personal and at a corporate level. The desire to avoid further environmental damage is really a key driver for many organisations, both when they're looking at new products to develop and also looking to reduce the environmental impact of current products. Life cycle analysis or LCA is a key tool that we can use throughout the development of new products and throughout the life cycle management indeed of existing products to understand the impact, where that impact comes from and how to reduce it. So over the next 20 minutes in this talk, we'll cover how to identify the carbon output in your development, in your products by using life cycle assessment or LCA as it's commonly abbreviated to. Then how to apply those findings to your device development, um, really throughout the development process from concept all the way through to productionization. And then we'll also look at an example of some of the really complex trade-offs that you have to consider um, looking at adding functionality, in this case, connectivity, um, and the comparison of three different injection devices and the impact that each of those have um, and how that trades off against the features available. So now we're going to delve a bit more into the life cycle assessment framework and the different phases and stages of the process. So life cycle assessment is really a well-structured framework which has been developed and codified as part of the ISO standard uh, noted on this page. Um, it's really a, the methodology for the assessment um, of a product or a process indeed over its whole lifetime and really gives us that insight-driven data-based um, understanding of where we can we, where we can really make a difference. So there's four key phases to the process. There's the goal and scope definition and we'll talk about each of these in a minute. The inventory analysis, so really understanding the product that you're looking at. Impact assessment, so how does that product impact the world? And then interpretation, which is then more, what do you look at and how do you deal with that? And how that's then applied to the wider world. Two of the really key things in my experience are stating the assumptions that are made. Um, rarely do you have a completely clean and full understanding. So you need to be able to say what assumptions you've made and also what limitations you've made. Um, so you may exclude certain elements. And one of the key things is to allow people to understand where those limits are and make sure that those are clear and also justifiable. So now we're going to delve a bit further into the first phase, the scope definition phase of the life cycle assessment. This is where it's really important that we define what we want to cover why we're doing it and what we hope to achieve from it. And one of the first things is working out the, the boundary of the, the life cycle that we're going to look at. Some of you may be familiar with the terms cradle to gate or cradle to grave or even cradle to cradle. And each of these describes a different boundary that can be drawn around the process of manufacturing, use and disposal of a product. So cradle to gate is about everything from raw material through to the point where it's been manufactured and it's ready for distribution and transport. Cradle to grave takes that further, looks at the distribution of the product, how it's used, the impact that that usage has, and then through to disposal at the end of the process. Cradle to cradle then looks at all of that and then adds in the potential for reuse, recycling of that product to bring it back in at the start of that process. Now, in the medical industry, um, there are lots of specialist processes, um, specialist requirements in terms of assembly, which can all add an extra level of complexity on top of this um, understanding of how materials are processed and how a product is manufactured. This is an area where our experience as a partner of many pharma and manufacturing companies really comes to bear, where we have that in-depth understanding of what happens throughout the process. And so we can take the understanding we have and apply it to performing these assessments. So now we move on to the, the real 
heart of the analysis process. So this is where we, we go through phases two and three of the assessment. Um, we look at the, the foreground data, the product specific characteristics. So this is for many products, the real meat of it. You know, we look at the mass of the parts, the materials that are used, the processes that are used and understand what all of those are. And that's really defined by us as we go through the, the process of understanding a product. And for some products that can be very simple, it's standard materials, standard parts. For others, it may be more, more complex. Um, there may be some unusual processes involved in there. It's also the thinking about, for example, the transport of sub-assemblies, the, the supply chain that rely, is part of the manufacturing process. Then all of that information is used alongside um, a lifecycle inventory database. Um, so that is a data set that allows you to say for a given part, material, process, what is the impact of that? And that can be gas emissions, water usage, energy usage, lots of other different ways that you can, you can look at that. And the combination of those two sets of data, the product specific and the, the life cycle um, inventory database, really then allows you to understand that output, which for the purposes of our discussion today, we're considering the carbon footprint. Um, so that's in grams of CO2 equivalent um, and is allows you to understand what that simple number that allows everything to be comp compared. Obviously, you've put in a number of components, a number of processes, assemblies, and that output data can either be rolled up into one nice high level single number, or it can be split down and you can look at contributions of different elements um, to help you look for those hotspots um, and look for areas of improvement. So at this point, we've gone from our, our scope, we've understood the product that we're looking at, we've applied some um, rigor to that, and we've ended up with our carbon footprint at the end of this. Now the key question is, what do we do with that? So having gathered all the data, the important thing is that we need to take that analysis and interpret it and make use of that information. Otherwise, it's a great exercise, but it doesn't actually lead us towards improving things. Now, obviously, we have mapped out here the entire development process, all the way from requirements definition through to industrialization and indeed beyond that into manufacture and life cycle management. The level of depth and analysis that can be done at different stages in that process is going to be radically different. When you're coming up with your requirements, it's probably going to be quite difficult to get down to what mass of a given polymer you're going to use. But you can still use some of the concepts and the tools within the LCA to understand the likely impact of different approaches that you might take. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, we, we like to integrate this throughout the entire development process. So in the requirements stage, in the concept generation stage, it might be quite a, a rough um, discussion based on some outline numbers, but it helps point you in different directions and also allows you to put some numbers behind that, which allows you to kind of judge the sustainability of a device on a numerical basis, which puts it in the same field as some of the more standard commercial factors. Um, as we move through the development, you know, proof of concept, detailed design, we've got more and more data and that data can be allowed to uh, identify hotspots. So you may discover that one particular material or one particular process or sub-assembly is a particularly um, impactful area of a product and you can work to reduce that. One of the key things throughout the process is balancing up the requirements of an aim for a sustainable product, which really needs to be documented at the start of the programme, along with you know, the pure engineering and the commercial factors. So while we would all love to have a entirely sustainable zero carbon product, we need to understand how that fits into the other business needs and 
what value we place on those um, those decisions. Finally, one of the, the tools that we look to use is a sustainability or a green file where as we move through the development process, we seek to push information, document it um, and really keep a record of those decisions that we've made and how we've made them. Because we all know that, you know, late in a development program, you question why you did things early on and having this in some ways like a design history file or other you know, design documentation but really focused on sustainability allows you to look back and look at those decisions um, which you can then revisit and understand why you made those those choices so we're now going to move on to a bit of a case study um, of how you could utilize an lca early on in the development process to examine the impact of various feature sets and it really gives an indication of the challenges associated with comparing some quite different products, um, which all respond to different patient needs and have different value propositions. This is really where the LCA is one of the tools in the toolkit. You know, we can look at this and we can come up with some numbers that give an idea of the impact of these different products. But to make a decision on what is the best overall, you need to look at some of the wider aspects of this. So, for example, the impact of having, uh, in this case, a connected device on overall healthcare costs, um, you know, avoiding a trip to the emergency room has, has a huge benefit um, and also the impact on the patient's symptoms themselves. So here we're, we're talking, going to talk a bit about digital connected devices. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware this is a big trend uh, in recent years and there's a lot of benefits to having connected products you know they can really help users um, work better with their doctors and with their symptoms and their management of those symptoms so many people see huge advantages in onboarding patients so really helping them understand how to use devices how to track their symptoms and dosing, um, how to manage those conditions at home. You know, you can have so much more information captured in something that people have with them all the time, rather than just waiting until they go and see the doctor. The data that's produced can be really helpful in terms of driving analytics, um, both for the patient and for the doctors. And for the pharma companies, you know, coming up with better products, looking at better dosing regimes, etc. And also having connected products with that you know, digital um, element in them can really provide extra data monitoring the environment or, you know, has the device been dropped? Where has the device been taken? And, and questions like that. So this really leads us to, to a major conundrum. Poor adherence, um, poor understanding of the patients is a, is a big clinical problem, you know, Patients not adhering to their regime gives inadequate disease control, also increases hospital admissions, you know, can lead to higher mortality rates. Digital devices can be a solution to that. But also we know that adding complexity, digital devices or more functions in even just in plastic components adds to the carbon impact, uh, carbon footprint of a product. So we have this balance that we have to achieve between um, adding functionality that's beneficial to the patients but also looking at the sustainability of the product and as i alluded to the lca can tell us part of that story it can tell us what the impact of the devices are but it can't necessarily look at the flip side of that which is the patient adherence and the benefits that come from that which is a wider healthcare sustainability and healthcare economics question so over the next few slides, I'm going to just do a very quick um, example of a comparison that we, we put together looking at three different injection systems and the carbon footprint that they have. Now, each of these fulfills a very different set of user needs. And some products may move towards the simple end, other products may want to move towards the more advanced end. And really, the question in this process is not which is the right solution, but it is what is the impact of choosing each of these solutions. So this is, I would say, at the 
earlier stage in the development process, you would you could perform something like this and give yourself a steer as to what the impact is likely to be, and then balance that against the, the wider picture. So we've got three systems here. We've got a low complexity system, really just a safety system around a, a standard syringe. We've then got a more complex auto injector device, spring powered um, de type device. Many of you will be familiar with those. And then on the right hand side, we've got essentially that with an added connectivity module and sensing capabilities. So that can really provide a whole bunch of data um, that can be relayed to either the patient or to the doctor or the, the pharma company. So we've taken this low complexity pre-filled syringe safety system device. We've looked at components or estimated some components that might go into it. And we've run that through our LCA database to give us an indication of the carbon footprint of this device. This is very much looking at the, the manufacturing process. So we've got split down, very simple part, really. We've got a primary pack, so the glass syringe, uh, the needle, the needle shield is uh, the primary pack, uh, and then a whole bunch of mechanical components, some of which are plastic, some of which are metal. And what we see here is a carbon footprint of just under 50 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, compared to a mass of about eight grams. So low total mass, low carbon footprint, very simple device. So we're now moving on to a more complex auto injector. So as I described, something with a, a spring in it, um, a, sy a syringe hidden inside the device. Um, again, got the primary pack in pink, and then we've got a slightly larger mass in total of plastic and metal that's wrapped around this. Obviously, we've got additional mass. Um, this leads to a higher carbon footprint. So here we've moved from something which was around eight grams to something that's 35 grams. But our carbon footprint has also increased up to almost 130 grams. So we've got something that's quite a lot more impactful on the environment here. However, given the fact that it's an auto injector rather than a safety system, it also adds a lot of extra functionality that many users will find beneficial. Finally, we move on to the potential impact of a connected auto injector. So this is taking almost exactly the same product, uh, an auto injector, and then adding a connectivity module to it. As we've spoken about, adding connectivity can be really beneficial to, to users, can help manage their conditions, reduce mortality, reduce admissions to hospital. However, as we can see, we've got a new color here, which indicates that almost 70% of, of the carbon footprint of this device comes from the electronics module. And we can see we've jumped up from 130 grams of CO2 to over 400 grams of CO2 for this product. And that is a huge increase over three times an increase in the carbon footprint. So we can really see that adding that extra functionality massively increases the impact of this. And then just to compare that, we'll move on to the next slide and look at a comparison of the three. So now, in summary, you can see three separate devices here, the pre-filled syringe with the safety system, the simple auto injector, and then the connected auto injector. And you can see the relative impact of each of those devices. And obviously the connected auto injector has a significantly larger impact than the other two. But as we say, it also adds significant additional functionality. Now this assessment has been done for single use devices. Um, obviously the pre-filled syringe and the auto injectors elements of these are like, very likely to be single use. However, it may be possible with something like a connected device that the connected module could be reusable, in which case the carbon footprint of that electronics module could be amortized over the lifetime of its use. So many uses would reduce that significantly in terms of the impact per usage cycle while still getting the benefits from it. 
And I think that's one of the areas where at an early stage in development, you could look at this and say, wow, connected auto injector, that's really bad. It's got a huge impact. However, you may say, well, let's make the electronics module reusable. That would then mean we get all those benefits, but we don't have the, the massive impact each time we, we produce a device. So drawing our small case study to a conclusion here, it's obvious from what we've seen that adding electronics, even with the rough estimates that we've provided as part of this, are a significant contributor to the carbon footprint of, of a device. However, as we've also said, carbon footprint is only one of the factors to consider. And understanding the effect of improved usability, improved adherence, can make a huge difference to the overall sustainability picture. Really, it's a reminder of the fact that while an LCA is a, is a really useful tool, it is only one of the tools in the sustainability toolkit. Um, I think we also should consider the patient journey as people go through their, their treatment uh, life cycle, if you like, from naive user to very experienced user and understand when functions such as connectivity are going to benefit people most. For example, a, a new naive user may benefit hugely from a device that instructs them how to use it, but somebody who has a chronic condition that has been using it for many years probably doesn't need as much support on that as that naive user. And considering that may allow us to reduce the overall um, carbon impact of treating a, a specific condition. So in final summary, um, the LCA or life cycle assessment is a really useful tool in understanding both current and proposed products and their environmental impact. It really allows us to delve down, get some data um, wherever we are in our development process that can support those discussions and those decisions in our development process. However, the really key thing is that we do need to translate it into action and we do need to use it to make those decisions and not put it on the shelf and ignore it. Really, we should be using this all the way through from looking at the requirements, looking at different concepts and all the way through every stage of our development process, we should be revisiting this assessment, adding more data to it and using it to highlight areas that we can really improve and push ourselves towards a more sustainable, higher performing product. I hope you've enjoyed, the, enjoyed that talk and found it helpful. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So as I mentioned, we'll now go on to a Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, please do click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens and we'll be happy to answer those. Um, just to start, we did have one come in. Um, so someone's asked, uh, what is the current practice with the sustainability of connected devices and what can we expect in the future? Well, that's a that's a very big question, um, and I'm not I'm not sure I can fully answer what the current practice is, um, but I can certainly save what we can see in the market and how that's likely to change. Um, at the moment, I don't think devices that have in the last few years been developed for connectivity have necessarily considered sustainability. Um, you know, I think in general, product development in the medical device arena is lagging slightly on considering sustainability. So I don't think it's been a, a real driver for those devices. Um, I think going back to the kind of, there's a number of different routes that you can take with connectivity, each of which is going to have a hugely different sustainability impact. You know, you can have the, the smart multi-use device, you know, something where it's really, you can use it for multiple years. You know, you think of your sort of your insulin pumps and, you know, other devices like that, which can, very easily be used for many years, have that electronics in there, and it's, it's very low impact because it is amortized over that huge time period. I think you've also got your single use devices, which is kind of where we were um, talking about in that case study, which is probably the kind of almost the simple bolt on, we've got a single use device, we'll just bolt something onto that, um, which isn't great as we showed. Um, I think if you move over to the reusable devices um, or the reusable modules rather. Um, there's a number of people out there that are looking at that type of device. Um, that's probably the most sustainable approach. Um, 
in my mind, if you've got a single use injector essentially with, with a connectivity module that you can add on. But I think that big, brings some huge concerns about usability. And if one of your arguments is, you know, the data helps adherence, um, how well, if people aren't adhering to their medication regime, how well are they going to adhere to adding a connectivity module on? Um, so I think there's some um, working out in the industry of what's necessary for the devices, um, what functionality you need to achieve and look at that and how you can achieve that functionality in a sustainable way. Brilliant. Thanks, Alistair. I hope that answered the question. Um, so I just had another one come through. Um, so someone say, has said, uh, how do you decide what type of LCA you need? Um, so for example, uh, how do you decide between doing a cradle to grave versus a cradle to cradle? Um, I think it's, it kind of, as I alluded to on that, on that slide, I think it really comes down to what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, if you have a product that you know is being incinerated, um, because it's hazardous waste after usage. Um, there's not much point considering a cradle to cradle cyclical nature. Um, you'd go down the cradle to grave approach. I think if you're looking at something where there is the element of reuse is possible, um, then I think that would be where you would put the cradle to cradle. Certainly if you were looking at, we can do this approach where we end up with our product being disposed of at the end versus this approach where we can design something that's reusable, you'd want to look at um, cradle to cradle for that. Excellent. Um, okay, I've said a, a couple more questions come in. Um, someone said, uh, although connected devices will perhaps have a higher CO2 footprint, um, it saves time going to the hospital, reducing healthcare costs, and COVID definitely sped this up. Um, I think that's more of a statement, but uh, do you want to comment uh, well, on that? No, it's, I, th I think it's absolutely true. And I think um, it is one of those things where you have to look at the appropriate device for the appropriate patient's group and condition. You know, absolutely a connected device has a higher CO2 imprint, footprint. And if that is something where, you know, people are going to hospital, then that may well save it. But I think we also need to bear in mind that there's many chronic conditions which are unlikely to lead to hospitalization. And if you're frequently using a device with a high footprint, then that probably doesn't trade off. You know, it's looking at the care pathways and the, how likely you are to end up going to the hospital um, to see if that balances out. Um, so absolutely, it, it can have hugely beneficial impacts. Um, it's just making sure you, you pick the right products with the right people at the right time to use it. Absolutely. Um, so just uh, another question in quick. Uh, someone's asked, how standardized is the LCA method at this time? Well, that's a, that's a slightly loaded question, I feel. The, um, I mean, there is, as, as I mentioned, a number of ISO standards that, that reference the LCA um, approach. And in many ways, the LCA approach is quite formalized. Um, however, like almost any ISO standard that deals with a method, it's kind of open to interpretation. And one of the big, um, I guess, challenges laid at the door of LCA as a technique is the fact that different people tend to get differing results based on, you know, exactly where you draw the boundary, exactly what data source you use, what assumptions you make. And I think that's why it's really important to, you know, make sure that if you are doing comparisons, that you're doing a fair comparison. You know, company A does a compare does an LCA on a product. Company B does an LCA on another product and publishes the data. Unless you delve quite deeply into that data, it's difficult to really get a fair comparison between the two. Excellent. Um, so I'm aware we're coming up to time. There might be time for just one more quick question, though. Um, yep. And I think these are there's two actually that tie in together. So. Um, would you say that uh, a, re a reusable add-on feature for a connected device would be better or worse than, say, um, a basic unconnected disposable device like the pre-filled syringe you mentioned? Um, I think it has the possibility to do that. Um, I think, as we said in the talk and in one of the previous answers, you know, that connectivity footprint is amortized over however many uses you have. Um, 
I think the big challenge for that is integrating it into a device in a way that works well and works reliably, and also making sure that users are able to use it and make use of that appropriately. And I think this is kind of where there's a big question about what connectivity actually means. You know, some, some people view it very much as you've got that connected module with some smart connectivity in it, you know, it talks to your phone, it talks to the internet, you know, the cloud, whatever. Um, but actually some of the other solutions that are out there, you know, where you've got um, some really, really simple elements in the product can provide you, you, know, you, you scan a pic, you take a picture of the device after you've used it in an app or something, can provide almost as much input, but doesn't have that um, carbon footprint associated with having all that electronics in there. So I think a, a reusable has huge potential. Um, the challenge really is implementing it in a way that works for, for the patients.